Hello friends and welcome back to Small Soldier and part two of the Tamiya 148 scale Spitfire Mark 1. If you recall in the first video we did the interior and cockpit of the aircraft and in this video we'll deal with the exterior painting and weathering. So sit back, grab your favorite beverage and prepare for takeoff. Hello all and welcome back to Small Soldier. If this is your first time here and you're into military modeling, you've come to the right place. Please consider subscribing to my channel and hitting the notification bell below, that way you'll be notified anytime I upload a video. Of course, before we get into the painting and weathering, we need to finish building the aircraft. Here you can see I'm using a homemade concoction called Sprugu. You can create this using a bottle of extra thin cement combined with leftover sprue bits from a previous build. It's essentially liquid plastic and in my opinion it makes it a lot easier to sand and finish seam work. Oh, a wise guy, huh? Well, I might be, but you should give it a try nonetheless. Make sure when you're wet sanding that you're using the appropriate type of sandpaper or sanding sticks. You must have sanding materials that are made for wet sanding or you'll end up with all the material flaking off the surface of the paper or the stick. By wet sanding I find I get a much smoother finish and your chances of scratching into the plastic are a lot less. You'll more than likely need to rescribe certain areas after sanding. This can be done with a sharp scalpel and some sort of scribing tool such as I'm using here. I had a set of Ultracast exhausts kind of kicking around so I thought I would use it on this build. This aftermarket part is made of resin. Resin can be brittle so you need to be careful when removing it from the sprue gate. You definitely don't want to destroy an expensive aftermarket part. I'm using Mercury Adhesive's Medium Viscosity CA Glue. I find it gives me just the right amount of working time. This is probably one of the best engineered kits I've ever had the pleasure of putting together. The fit and engineering was second to none. Ah, in a perfect world, if every kit could be like this. Whenever possible, I like to use aftermarket gun barrels. But when I can't, I find this method is the best way to get realistic results.
Again, I'd like to stress how well this kit went together. You almost feel like you're cheating because it really shouldn't be this easy. Well, at least compared to some of the other kits I've built in the past. This was truly one of the most remarkable parts of the build. This literally snapped into place. And if you're an aircraft modeler, you know what a bear this wing root can be to fix. And as you can see here, the fit was perfect. This is next level sh Uh oh. You can use Tamiya lacquer thinner on bare plastic without it affecting it at all. It works great for dissolving putties like Mr. Surfacer or Tamiya putty. The rest of the build was pretty straightforward with no major issues. And it was finally time for me to get some paint on this thing. As always, I like to use a painting mule to test out new techniques, painting and weathering procedures. I would suggest not doing this on your finished model, it'll only bring you grief. As with all kits, there are some parts that uh, rub you the wrong way, and these painting masks were one of them. I wasn't sure if you had to cut inside the black line or outside the black line, and things didn't fit as tightly as I'd hoped. I would suggest you get yourself a set of Edward masks or use the tried and true method of cutting them yourself. I painted the interior color first so that when the top colors are on you still see an interior color from the inside. These Mr. Color Super Metallics are great if you want to get a very realistic looking metallic sheen. They're also incredibly durable and stand up to a lot of punishment. I sprayed it about 10 PSI and put the color on in thin light coats. There was no thinning required and was used straight from the bottle. As soon as the model dried, I gave the whole thing a coat of Mr. Leveling Thinner straight up. This does exactly what the name says and helps to give the whole model a nice, smooth, even finish. I've tried several different hairsprays in the past and in my opinion, this particular brand works best for the hairspray chipping technique. So the procedure goes base color, a layer of hairspray, and then your top color over that. The idea is to wet the area that you want to get the chips on and keep working back and forth and eventually the chips will just start forming as the water soaks through to the hairspray layer beneath.
Now as far as I'm concerned, everybody should have this product in their toolbox. It's one of the best products I've ever found for masking. You can mold it to any shape and it won't harm paint surfaces. As a reference, when applying the hairspray, I like to spray about five or six inches away from the model and two to three light coats. And again, I'm spraying the paint in light layers until I achieve the correct opacity. If you have to mask along an area that has contours to it, a toothpick works great for burnishing those areas down. So if you find you're getting a lot of bleed through, try this technique. When airbrushing, I always make sure to hit every area from every angle. This way you'll guarantee full coverage of whatever you're painting. This is a new technique I've been experimenting with lately and I've found I've developed a much more precise way of creating those really small microchips. I like to use medium and fine sanding sticks for this job. I'll just dip them in the water and take a little excess off on the glove and then start sanding in small circular motions. The results after about five minutes of work. I'll continue with this procedure until I achieve the desired effect. By using the sanding method, I feel I can control the surface and the chips a lot more than with a paintbrush. It's by no means a quicker way of creating a chipped effect, but in my opinion, I think it's well worth the effort. I mixed my own camouflage colors loosely based on what Tamiya had provided in the color callouts in their instruction booklet. A layer of hairspray has already been applied to the metal surface and I'm just putting the camo colors over top of that and then we'll chip it from there.
Again, if you haven't tried Silly Putty for masking, you need to try this stuff because it'll make your life so much easier when it comes to masking. It's so simple as you can see here. I'm just pushing the putty into the shape I need and you can adjust it right on the model and you can sleep at night because you know it's not going to affect the painted surface at all. And let me tell you my friends, I've been down that road and there's absolutely nothing more disappointing. Silly Putty takes itself seriously when it comes to masking. I think removing masks has to be one of the most satisfying parts of any build. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Tell me what your favorite part of the modeling process is. Some of the chipping was done off camera, but I thought I'd show you a little more of the sandpaper chipping technique here on the leading edge of the wing. I use a light touch to start and then gradually I get more aggressive as I go along until I start to see the chips forming. I thought the green was lacking a little intensity and a filter here would give it a little more life. Prussian green is the color used to create this filter. I used a soft number six round brush to blend the filter out. If you're interested in knowing the difference between a wash and a filter, I have a video specifically on that and it'll be linked in the upper right hand corner. You can go and watch that video after this one's done. If you haven't noticed already, I'm applying these decals to a matte surface. What? Have you lost your mind, man? I'm sure many of you are saying that. It's true. I decided to use a matte surface on this model. I wanted to do a test to see how this thing would work. These are the kit supply decals which are a little on the thick side and are known for their inability to conform to surfaces. They certainly lived up to the hype, but in the end, I showed them who's boss. That's right, no decal can withstand the power of Solvacet. This stuff will kick the crap out of any decal that won't conform. And we're all about conformity on this channel. After everything is sucked down tight, I like to take a sharp scalpel blade and cut in between all the panel lines so the decals look like they're painted on. Next, I add a gloss coat to seal in the decals. I don't think there's really a need to do an overall gloss coat, this seems to be able to do the trick. And finally a coat of matte varnish to blend it all back in. Looks pretty good if I do say so myself. When painting bright colors such as yellow or red over a dark surface, it's always a good idea to paint white first 
If you skip this step, your yellows will end up looking muted and muddy. Same goes for the red here. And the final step of construction is to add all those painted sub-assemblies. Payne's Gray is an excellent color if you're wanting to stain or add a pin wash to white or light gray. I never use black to panel wash anything. I always use a gray or a brown or a greenish brown to add my washes. Black is way too harsh and just makes things look toy-like. You're probably wondering why is this numbskull using such a small brush to do this job when a bigger brush would make it go quicker? Well, I asked myself the same question when I watched this. And to be honest, I don't have a good excuse. Probably just lack of sleep. Once I get the white dirtied up enough, I will go back in and do the pin wash and all the panel lines with that Payne's Gray. Aircraft tend to have this streaking effect that appears from access panels or areas that protrude. I create these from a very thin brown or gray mixture and just pull those down from certain areas where this may occur. I forgot to mention that when painting black I don't use actually a black color. I'll use some kind of grayish blue, dark greeny blue mix such as uh, Tamiya NATO black or in this case rubber black. The reason I do this is for scale effect. I think black makes things look a little too harsh. And I think a nice 70 or 80 percent gray just has a nicer feel to it. Industrial Earth is one of my favorite weathering colors to use. It has a nice grimy, oily tinge to it that is perfect for this kind of application. I like to use a lot of OPR or oil paint rendering. This technique was created by the great Mike Rinaldi. It's something I like to use when building up several layers of oils to create a certain effect. An overall wash of brown is used next to tie the two camouflage colors together. It's then removed with a soft paper towel in the direction of airflow. After this is dried, I'll use some buff oil paint to create some fading on the upper wing surfaces. Everything is then blended out using a soft brush.
combat aircraft are generally shown having a lot of staining around the propeller, engine areas, and fuel filler caps. Leaking fluids will generally be found following the flow of the aircraft, but it's always a good idea to check historical references just to get an idea of where these may occur. Another method I use for creating faded surfaces is to add pigment to the oils. This can create a lot of nice subtle and distinct effects. And sometimes there's no better tool than the old finger. And where there's light, there's darkness. I added some dirty brown tones here to simulate worn areas from boots and such. I also find by grinding in pigment straight into the paint surface with a blending stump, I can create another layer of variation to this effect. Using graphite is a great way to add extra sheen to metallic surfaces. You can also use an artist's silver pencil to create even more of a shine. And by blending these two together, you get the best of both worlds. I pulled a real Homer Simpson on this one. I thought that by gluing on the wheels, they would hide these pin ejection marks. Well, they certainly didn't. I saw this after the fact, after everything was painted. So there was a bit of touch up to do, but not the end of the world. I also created some nice subtle staining effects using a paint spattering technique. I thought it might be kind of cool to add a subtle faded effect to the fabric surfaces. I did this with an old school technique called dry brushing. Yeah, it's still a thing. A dusty filter was also used to create this faded effect. Alclad has a wide range of metallic paints and this burnt iron color was perfect for this application.
graphite and silver pencil were also used to great effect on the propeller. I used this silicone tip brush and this artist stump to create subtle weathering effects. Q-tips are another great tool to have in your modeling box and can be a perfect solution for blending. Spitfires had distinctive looking exhaust staining. The outer area had a blackish, brownish type color and the inside had this very white grayish tone that ran through the middle of it. And this is what I was hoping to achieve here. I also used some oil paints to help blend these tones into the paint surface a little better and create more of a random type feel to that smoke staining. And apparently the pipes would take on a bit of this whitish tone as well. At the time of making this video, I didn't realize that the cheese cutter antennas on the back of the aircraft, that's the ones that go into the side of the fuselage attached to the tailplane, isn't historically accurate for this particular aircraft, so they will be removed later on. Well, that'll do it for this video. Thanks for sticking with me, folks. And I'll be painting this fella up in part three where we'll put the aircraft and this guy in a small scene together. Stay tuned. Hey, if you like this video and you dig what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing. It really does help promote my channel and get it out to others just like you. Hey, if you really want to support me, you can go here to make a financial donation to my channel. There's different levels of support, just like on Patreon, and you can choose the one that suits you best. I appreciate all the support you've given me so far, and I thank you in advance. I hope to get the next video out to you as soon as I can, and as always, remember to keep those brushes wet.